But we could, if uh, I lose everybody, we could just stop at the end of Hindum Miller and, and just skip the higher end extension part. And if you have been uh, familiar with this topic, topic please, uh, please be patient that just think it like us a way if it could be a good tutorial for a newcomer because I know this topic would be an interesting one for, for uh, those people interested into the type system. Okay, so some of you might have uh, aware that this t-shirt, that with the Hindemir type system printed on the t-shirt, I call it HMM t-shirt. Maybe you go to <laughs> visit the HMM store, then you will find it. And you just can't get it, what does it say? And if you zoom in a little bit, you will notice that there are a lot of math, uh, math, mathematical logic symbol, and it's to you, it's kind of elvish, you can't understand any single bit of it. So uh, I sum up a few of reasons that why it is so hard for uh, people that is not from a similar background. That because the uh, language used for describe this whole system is uh, the language used in academy. And it's perfect it's for uh, being sad and no mistake, but not easy for a uh, comprehension. And for people inside academy, they use it frequently. So you have to pick up the jargon and intuition to know that. And sometimes you uh, bump into the form. That is not the form that you could read out an algorithm. That's not the syntax direct form that's driven by syntax. And, and even you uh, look at the language, the, a lot of tutorial just for a simple, simplified formal language, but doesn't uh, look very similar to Haskell, and uh, you don't understand why I have to learn this simplified language, but not Haskell. And uh, the, the answer is that the Haskell type system is much, much more complicated. But as a foundation that you learn this simplified formal language, that, that you could uh, get the basic, and you can eventually get the idea of what the Haskell is doing. And the next question is, is uh, clear why we need Hindu meter types and it just bumped out at some previous time and you don't understand why we use it now. Uh, but you could trace it back to the early uh, 20th, 20th century that uh, it's, um, the, type, the type, whole type theory, theory is developed at, around that time and uh, at a certain point that PL community know aware that it could be used for programming language theory and it's quite useful for prevent programmer to, uh, to get some uh, mistake in programming. So in this talk, uh, I'm going to derive, uh, trying to uh, start from intuition and example, but uh, and trading off exactness for easier comprehension. And let's start from a simplified one. So if you go into a McDonald's, Supposing that uh, that a burger is made of uh, bread and beef, then how could you express a make burger function? That we so to define such a function that we have to define a simplified formal language, which is uh, like this. It's it's I would like to call it because the example is McDonald. I would like to call it system MC, which is McDonald, but actually it's lambda calculus then the make function could be expressed like this. With a little icon like you could put two things like bread and meat, then the output would be a burger. Then in text form would be the following. But it's unsafe, you could put anything in to make a burger. So therefore we have to extend the language a little bit to, uh, to annotate with type. That like with double column burger, so that with annotation, we could just think it like a label. You could put tag a label on it. So with the, the building rules uh, that we, the programmer know that, claim that uh, burger making is like bread and beef than making a burger like that, because the Curry Howard for us thought is that we call it hamburger making theory. Then we could type check this program with the, with the rule of the theory that we have two things and return a burger, then give it its input. But if you think it 
backward that is not only for type checking because the above formulas that all of things are given. If we miss something that we could like infer back to to those missing part. Like it's guessing look at what the value is, but then guess it's type what its type is. So if we know the rule that makes bread and getting a bread and beef and getting a burger, then if we have missing two things, then what are this question mark would be? So uh, let's start with uh, a fuzzy idea that if we want to have an inference algorithm, what the function would be like. It's like it's a function with infer row. That row is, is the type name. And if, because the inference involves some states, and we have to put it into a model uh, called TC's uh, type check for means type checking. And so with this function that uh, we know that because we have to put, uh, eventually we need to get some type variable. It's still empty, but we need to do some magic and put the final result into that. So we allocate a reference and uh, calling something else and eventually read that reference back, which should be the answer for the inference result. Then what would be the next? So uh, if you develop some intuition that uh, we want, first want to reform reformulate our problem is, uh, if you put it like this and, and you think it like uh, it should be two formula combined and solve it like a high school algebra. So is, uh, is this observation correct? The answer is yes. The essence of the type inference is uh, to walk the whole abstract syntax tree and collect the constraint look like this and uh, solve the missing part as you would do at, for high school algebra. And this problem is called unification problem. So with a tiny example is like, uh, the unification problem is uh, an equation, left hand side should equal to the right hand side. Then we, we fill out T1 with int and T2 with int, then both sides should be equivalent. So then with the example previously mentioned, then with these two equations given, then solving the equation should give us b equal to b and a equal to bread. So with this set of solution, we call it unifier in academic terminology. So with the problem reformulated, then but one thing still missing is that we want uh, the eventual type result with a lot of error, probably with some error embedded inside and, and those things still missing. And uh, so it's not in the syntax or the parse abstract syntax tree. So we still have to figure out that how to generate the type level uh, grammar syntax thing. So uh, I just name it like a type expression with a grammar generation like temporal variable generation like this. So with a row, which is the function I name it infer row, right? The row could, if I want to inf infer it eventually to int to int to int, then the process will be like uh, row be rewrite by grammar to expand it to tau to tau, then and another time tau to tau to tau, then and uh, sub substitute by some constant type which could be int, then, then all of them could be int. So with this grammar, I call it the row and tau as meta variable for expanding the, the type expression. The row is the, in, what is the row we name it, <coughs> the inferred row. So with this grammar, the, then uh, transform it into the Haskell type then would be like this. The type is quite uh, obvious, like function is function type, is uh, one of type to another type, which is algebraic and could be itself, or is a constant, or it's a type variable, which 
should be the variable we should fill. And another is meta variable is is for merely for expansion that the uh, meta type variable is the row thing. So uh, and we use a trick for type variable. It's uh, it's for it's using a reference. It could be reference to some actual uh, realized tiles could, which could be some tree but we use reference to point to that place so it could be also be empty that means still not expanded ex expanded or it could be expanded to something uh, that it points to then with all the basic setting done we could start walking the actual, actual AST so with the example uh, uh, expression, then uh, the tree would look like this, which is uh, uh, which a top level application for the beef, and another application for the bread, and inside is an annotation, and underlying is lambda calculus. I use a lambda symbol for that which the uh, first layer, because only one single argument, right? So first layer is x, then second layer is y, and I use b as a short term, shorthand for burger. So with this thing, then the infer row, uh, uh, we call another type checking row thing for that. The expression is this expression, and we run it with infer mode, in inference mode, and the reference should uh, eventually get the answer. So the first step is application. That, then the next step in the TC row for application case uh, is called a unified function with the supposing that we have inferred the function body and get its result. We want it to get to something like argument and result that, but what is that actually is uh, the unification algorithm unification algorithm we mentioned before that this algorithm is for solving unification problem that uh, depends on the problem you solve could be a little modification for variant so this function does two things one is for high expression expansion for like expand one single meta variable into some kind of long uh, tree and uh, with arrow embedded and unified trying to make both sides of equation uh, at least structurally be equivalent so the unified tau and the function type which is a1 to a2 then this constraint would be like this the tau be equal to this function a1 to a2 so with if we write it into program it will be like if it's already a function type then okay then it's just return it if otherwise then we want to first allocate a type variable for the argument which is the right hand, right hand side a1 and result type uh, allocate another one for a2 so then with this thing assuming that that unify is doing the type checking thing to check the both sides of the equation be equivalent then we call this thing to check if it results any error. If, if both sides doesn't unify, then it should get some error and abort the program. If it's fine, then we get the uh, structurally expanded uh, type into arch ty, pair of arch ty and result ty. So inside the unify, uh, I, we would do even further for a function that we want both sides, uh, we know both sides to look like this, right? But we still uh, doesn't know what, uh, don't know what's inside the A and what's in B. So we have to recursively call itself to, to solve, uh, unify the argument with uh, the right hand side's argument and uh, left hand side's result to right hand side's result, which uh, uh, sounds reasonable, right? And so that's for the function case. And the following, another following is that for the meta variable, as I said, is, uh, could be reference to uh, other things. So if we 
uh, heading to a case that the unified function that both of them are meta variable. We we know that we then we have to uh, uni uh, check if in the the thing they point to are equal or not. If they aren't equal, then then uh, it's not not okay. If if they are equal, then it's fine. If only one of them are meta variable, then we have another case to handle. If uh, because it's a reference, so uh, the reference we just uh, take out the thing inside the reference. If it's a thing, then okay, then we unify the thing inside the reference. And uh, the other thing is normal thing, right? Which is T1. If it's another meta is having and handled by this case. So if there is something already bound for the meta variable, then it's okay. If it's still unbound, then what's happening? We still have to cover that case. That means like a uh, row st still unbind to something. Then we have to handle this case is <coughs> uh, like uh, we already know that TV1 is nothing. It's, it's a meta variable with nothing inside. Uh, so, so we know that TV1 is unbound. Then we have to check with TV2, which is inside the uh, second meta variable. If there is a thing inside, then we could it could still be another meta variable inside. So we unify the first thing meta variable to the thing inside the second meta variable. And if if the second thing is nothing, then uh, then okay, then we just uh, save what the thing it points to into the meta variable TV1 to point TV1 to what TY to locate that. So that's for um, the so here the unbound variable means uh, the meta variable is unbound. Okay. Then another case is that uh, TY2 is uh, like either function or type variable or type constant, then we have to check if uh, it doesn't actually capture any uh, variable. If it doesn't actually capture any of, we use the same name variable. Then if that's okay, then we just simply save it to TV1. Okay. Then the rest of them is a trivial case. Like for constant and constant, then we just compare them to see if they are equal, right? If we are unifying burger and burger, then the result should be fine. And uh, one thing to be extremely careful about is that uh, the type variable here is, uh, is not the variable we usually uh, refer to when we are we, de we are developing. The, is, if their, their naming are different, then they are not the same. So A1 is A1, but A1 is not A2 because their names are not the same. So, uh, so it's quite confused, confusing that if, if you just, uh, you are new to this uh, field. Uh, and the rest of the case is uh, like uh, TY bar to T and T both of the arguments are TY bar. Then we just simply compare it as we do for the type constant. And that's above all is all of the case we have to handle. If it falls through, then just are able to unify that, which means the type checking failed. Okay, so the unification algorithm is the essence of the hinder-minder type system. And although we, we are just in this example, we are doing for uh, simply type lambda calculus, but in general, the whole algorithm, uh, uh, the layout is pretty similar, just uh, with a few little modification. So getting back to walking the abstract syntax tree, we have done the application uh, with the uni fun unify function, right? So with argument, uh, it's uh, expected to uh, by the function definition. This is 
the type we inferred, and we split it to uh, expected argument and type and result type. Then at the application case, we have to check if the input and argument are, are they uh, the same. That's for simply type lambda calculus case. Uh, so we just call the check row uh, uh, for checking, which is doing uh, the TC row call itself in the type checking mode. And the, the last one, uh, last one statement is, is just simply uh, save it back to the, the return value, which is a reference we pass in to the TC row. We just put the result into the expat uh, type. As uh, I call it uh, for in row, uh, sim uh, in this case, in the simple type lambda calculus, it's, it's uh, trivial. But for the later extension for hidden demeanor types, it's, it's just, we just needed this abstract layer for easy comprehension. So walking down a level is another application which they do the same thing. And the next level is uh, annotation, that we know the annotation is this thing, then we still do the checking as we have done for application, right? We check the body, if the body type, if it matches the annotation, and save the re annotation back to the thing we returned. Then the next level is lambda. Lambda have the uh, input and body. And so we first allocate a type variable for the input. Then with the given symbol var uh, is variable, right? That we put it into a environment that's uh, like this. We just save it like, thinking like a hash table that we know that uh, the variable, this variable name corresponds to the the type which is far T Y we uh, allocate. Then for the later inference in the body, then we could use this for inference for the inference. And after that, we write the uh, function, uh, which because this is a lambda right, it's, it's a function. This function type to to the reference where it it uh, returned. Then, in, if it runs in type uh, in the check, the above is for the inference mode. And if it's in the type checking mode, which could be called by uh, the check row function, then we we still uh, call unified fun to expand the expanded type and and do the further checking for the body uh, in the lambda to see if the, they are structurally equivalent. Then for the, uh, for the argument, we, because we have allocated the variable right in the uh, saving somewhere in the environment, could be a hash table, then we just look up the environment, then save it into the return value, which is that a TY, then which is, this is simple and understandable. Then another level of lambda, which doing the exact thing again, but now we have two things in the uh, variable environment, which X should be the type of bar TY1, and Y to be the bar TY2. Then uh, doing the same thing again that we know that Y type should be in the environment. Then we get the right hand side burger type, which is trivial. It's just saving the burger type into the return value. Then going back to the annotation, that uh, because of the calling, we know that body is should we get the constraint that body. It could be should be equal to the right hand side, look looking like this, and so we have annotation uh, here should be look like this. Then unify algorithm like unify the left hand side to the right hand side bread to beef and burger, 
that uh, should be split out and uh, to some like only the right hand side left with bar ty2 to burger and beef to burger then eventually only three unified union okay then after calling ty is another constant type which is uh, trivial then going back to the application uh, check. so we check the check row uh, arc making sure that it's okay for the bra as input then say beef burger to its return value with its row beef burger to burger xp ty then another is constant then we basically finish all of the thing this is the tree walking uh, is that okay okay how can you be so sure that um, the type of the previous ones, like the variables, how can you be sure that there's beef and burger? Like, I wonder if you have something like uh, instant burger, which you could put in water to make burger, then you basically have two ways to make burger. And so how do you know it's, 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 it's bread and beef and not uh, instant burger plus water? Does that make any sense? Uh, you are say referring to the rule itself, or uh, because we have write it down the rule for bread and burger, so we as Oracle to claim that rule to be true. You all okay, the so thing so is based on that. There's only one way to make a burger, right? Yeah, yeah. That's the you when you. Programming in Haskell, you write a type right? that's the thing you claim that should be the theory should be the true And what you program is a proof to prove that theorem the thing you claim uh, Okay, so we finished all of the uh, Algorithm which although uh, I, I think there should be still a lot of things uh, to figure out if you are new to this but in general, you get some general idea for how the thing works, right? But the problem is the type system is too simple. The simply type lambda calculus, no generalization in the how the banger, burger is made. Oh, is made. So that's the thing you refer that we want to generalize the thing to uh, incorporate that something else that the burger should not be just meat. Could be crown like you go to a moss burger, could be rice burger. So, so if you're calling this thing, then it should uh, work, right? So the trick of uh, discovered by Hinlin and Miller independently is to add a last syntax into the grammar to add these things so that from the syntax we could tell where where should. Uh, the type should be generalized. So uh, the first thing is that for the language, simplified language itself, we have to extend above the thing we defined. We have to add some polytypes like the for all uh, in Haskell. So uh, for as a matter of fact, think it like it's no longer just a label for a burger. It's a blank label Thing that you could put on anything or draw anything on the label. So, uh, and the type would uh, it look like this. So for A, B, and become a burger. And the syntax with the lat added would look like this. We add a uh, lat name term term case here, which is uh, correspond the name and a term and term. So, but notice that for the Hindu Miller type system, the for all only ha allowed to happen at the outermost. It's not in the arrow, but at, at the outermost should always at the la uh, the leftist side. Then we can see that we just need basic uh, a few extend to the previous structure defined. Then we could get the Hindu Miller. So the grammar to expand the uh, type level. Uh, 
expression, we add a for all called sigma. It's sigma type is the poly type we, we call it. So, and bound is for the for all. Bound variable is for the for all inside this. So, sigma could be a lot of for all variable and a simple row thing, and could be a lot, lot, lot of thing inside. Other, other, so we only thing we added is like for all type row here. Other thing uh, should be the same. So, with the poly type, Introduce <coughs> so a uh, concept, a corresponding concept is also introduced called instantiation. Uh, it's replacing uh, the uh, type variable captured by for all with uh, uh, another fresh type variable or type concept. So if you take a look at the example, the left hand side instantiates the right hand side. So for all a Insatiate burger and this A to A insatiate burger to burger and B1 without for should be something. Although I call it time variable, but it's not uh, that variable, it's just something empty that you should feel, but it's not exactly as the variable we, uh, as you saw in C or C. Plus. Then you could instantiate the blank label with, draw, with a pen, draw it to a Burger King label. So it's a uh, work like this. Then with the instantiate function, we just replace every type variable uh, uh, in the topmost four with a newly instantiated type variable with a unique name. So that with that unique name, you could uh, you could like apply the same uh, trick as we define a simply type lambda calculus. So with this thing, if the sigma type is a for all case, then we just knew a lot of uh, meta variable for further extension, and then substitute the body in the type with this newly typed, newly allocated meta variable. With the example like this, like for all A1, A2, then we just uh, allocate some tau1, tau2, which is also type variable, but not for all type variable, which still you have to fill in something into tau1 and tau2, but not they, are, they are not the same as for all A1 and A2. Then, as uh, I said previously, instantiate row, if we just uh, save it, right? Then now we call the instantiation, then say the result of what has been instantiated. So uh, that should be the instantiation thing or the burger thing, right, for the very simple case. Then with another case introduced is generalization, which is also a key part for Hindemiser. It's replacing a simple type variable as you saw in the tau1, tau2 with for all variable. So with a, uh, I write poly type here, but uh, thinking like uh, replace a, a normal C++ function and add a template uh, declaration above it, so it make it to a C++ template function. It works quite similar to that. So thinking like that way, then we could uh, extend the infer row further to the version of infer sigma. So what infer sigma do is that uh, with knowing that uh, we just first do the infer row for the expression passing, then we just add a quantify, we just add a for all up at the head of the type level expression. But we have to exclude the symbol that only happened in the right hand side of type variable, but not at the left hand side. Otherwise, we just make the for all capture, ca capture extra variable, right? Because what's happening outside should left to the outside. What's happening inside the should left for inside. So the for quantify this for all statement, just close like a gate, just close it for the inside of the body. Okay. 
So uh, with a few of example, with like this, suppose that we have variable type variable b1 to a1, then we use a for all to close it. That we close it for b, and we assume so we just assume that because just for demonstration that a1 is bound by our, our outer scope, so we just uh, skip it. And uh, the, then we just kind of the for generalization is wipe out the use an eraser to wipe out the Burger King label to into a blank label sticker. Okay, for the generalization case is um, one case to handle is that it's tricky to compare two polytypes. For the simply type lambda calculus is obvious, right? Because it's just only what could happen is only burger or meat, but not like for all a a, not like that. So for comparing burger to burger is simple, but for comparing polytypes it needs some special uh, trick. So saying that the right hand side is the annotated type and the left hand side is the inferred type, then uh, this. This uh, operator means more polymorphic. So the left hand side is more polymorphic than the right hand side, uh, which is obvious. And so a trick for uh, comparing two polytypes is that uh, just uh, drop the for all for the uh, for for the right hand side that we and replace it with a unique name which is previous on C and see if the left hand side could uh, instantiate the right hand side. So uh, <coughs> then write it into the program, then uh, the, uh, the previous check row will become check sigma. The check sigma first split the sigma into, uh, uh, into the for all variable and the variable for the type expression. I wrote it for a special name because for it's it's on it's for the extension of higher rank in the latter half of this talk. But the thing it does is just re, uh, just like instantiation. Just uh, we write all of those four things into some unique name type variable name. So allocate a lot of unique type variable and substitute for uh, the for then so with this thing done then we guess for all type variable and row then we can just as the trick we previous demonstrated we could just use the uh, previous defined check row for the simple row case because it's no longer for all Okay, it's a little bit difficult to uh, get ahead, get uh, to understand it, but it's how it works. Okay, so the rest is the uh, to do some uh, checking, so it, it doesn't uh, uh, accidentally capture extra variable, but it's just for checking. But the essence is for the above. Okay, with another tree walking, then with this expression, uh, I just skip the left hand side because we have already made it. We just, at the top level, it's a left. <coughs> so when we bumping into the left, we use infer sigma, but not infer row. And the infer sigma would generalize the type expression with and for. So, this lat, we would put it into the environment. So in our environment, the type is no longer simple case like burger or meat, but with something with, with for its polytype. So then inside the right hand side, the uh, lat body, we could use this for to Really, instantiate the new type variable for inside the left body. Okay, so when we walk into the right, uh, bumping into an app, 
we no longer use chat row or instantiate row. Then we use the sigma version. So we check if uh, <coughs> the, the argument type could subsume the function argument type. Then, then using the check sigma, which is defined before, it, we check it. Check sigma is to compare two polytypes to see if one of them could is more polymorphic than the other. So comparing to the simply type lambda calculator is just simply uh, compare it the check uh, simple equal or not, right? Then instantiation sigma is uh, instantiate the result inferred back to the thing we should return, which is exactly y. Okay, so another app which is the same. And F is also the same, just we looking up F, when we're looking up the F, what is what store inside is polytype. Then we instantiate this polytype into something actualized that could be like a bread, burger, and back to the thing return. Then the constant type, which uh, uh, which in this case is, 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 the, is not that different because it's a constant. But in general, we, we just call the instant sigma version to back to the thing it returned. And for annotation, we check if the, uh, which is also the same thing we should do for, uh, for the application checking for the function argument. It's the same first do checking, then instantiate. Okay, that, but for the unification algorithm, just nothing need, needed to be done. So the only thing we have, all, all of the thing we do is, is, is just uh, make, descend the road to make it uh, incorporate the sigma, the polytype for the for all case. That uh, for simple type comparison, that uh, we, we, we can't just naively do it. We have to do some trick to make two polytype compare. That's the thing you have to uh, think it through so that you could get a handle of how the hinting linear type works. So uh, uh, what's the defect of hinting linear type system, which is going, I'm going to talk the higher rank. So, uh, so everyone follows that I should keep going or we should stop here. That is, I lose everybody. Oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> so even with the addition of LATS, uh, it only tell with the syntax, I, we only tell the system to generalize at the place where the LATS <coughs> should happen. So, but for the case that we have a generalized function passing in, which like callback call, call, call function, that we want to call ID, that, uh, to pass in, then we can handle that because the lab polymorphism doesn't generalize the argument place. So, but and it's and this case is happen it's happening everywhere. So we should make type system to uh, incorporate this case. So the program should uh, uh, pass through the type checking. Like make burgers, we just want to pass in the main function into another function, accepting make which is polymorphic function, and make two burgers, which is bread burger and rice burger, which is, sounds reasonable, right? Uh, so, then it's, uh, so here comes the higher rank type system. It's more, the following is more mathematical symbol, so could be hard to understand, but uh, trying hard. So to solve the problem of lab point of is <laughs> it's not generalized at the argument. Uh, so uh, a trade-off is that we don't want to make the type system another big change. Like we don't want to overhaul the whole type system. We just want to make a slight modification and maybe, maybe re asking programmer to add a little uh, annotation for that 
it wouldn't cause a lot of burden, but uh, in general could make the case uh, past the type checking. So for the simplified language we define is like uh, we add an annotation at the argument. We add a for all for uh, the passing function. So this uh, this is the paper, uh, the previous research define what has been implemented in Costco. Uh, the, the answer we should do. Okay. So we have to do another. Uh, modification for the type expression which adding annotated lambda uh, okay so which is making uh, the argument with an annotated like burger okay so and other thing keep the same and and make the row could derive sigma to sigma which is polytype to polytype that previously is only uh, rho to uh, sig sigma, right? Now it could be tau or sigma to sigma. So now the type level expression could be anything that for all could have happened at not only at the last, at the most last place, but could be the like the after the first arrow or Caresses the argument, the, this function in the argument. Okay, so for the type level expression, it's okay. Yeah. So the, the first one of these two examples is now higher. Uh, okay, I, I know. I know. It's exactly I know. Like I know. It's it just I just make the grammar as an example. That okay. Oh. I'm the same because it's exactly equivalent for all a to a to a. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's probably I can still get something wrong. But yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I just keep going. Okay. <laughs> and then, what's the most difficult thing? Okay. Oops. Uh, in extending to higher rank is like. Uh, when comparing to two polytypes, uh, uh, since we allow for all to to be put at anywhere, that but it's the thing is the case we have to handle. But apart from that, it's few things we have to change with the previous layout we defined. Uh, so uh, the question in the paper. Uh, uh, the question should be asked is whether the two exp uh, type expression are equivalent. But uh, with they have uh, annotated uh, logic uh, derivation uh, in the paper, but I didn't write it because uh, it's uh, hard to understand. But in general, with uh, I call it intuitive, but it's not that intuitive. But uh, I want to prove it that the second one could be rewrote, rewritten to the first one, but but not vice versa. So for the second one to be could be first be uh, by uh, remove the for all thing into some actualized type variable, and 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 add the for all at the last most. So could be rewrote into the first one. Which is uh, an issue is that uh, we could the programmer could annotate the uh, type into in the in the second case, but but the system algorithm infer to be the first one. Then, but they are not the same by the mechanics. Okay, so our goal is that we would like them to be isomorphic. <coughs> Okay, so uh, then the following should be type ch checked. That is, uh, the following should, two should hold. Okay, uh, which is that left hand side should be more polymorphic than the right hand side. And right hand side should be also polymorphic uh, than the left hand side. Then uh, 
in the paper, it defined uh, a form called print form. That is using, uh, I think, it like a hacky way that to lift the form into the top level that uh, just float out the form B into the into the latter form so that they could be compared. Uh, so that then we could see that if one is more generalized than the other. Okay, so the scholar mice we see before, which should have been extended from only the case ones, which is doing uh, the flowing out thing to making sure that the type system, uh, sorry, type expression uh, to make it uh, to the second one, okay? Then we just do all the floating out, making the fall in the right hand side to, at, to be at the most left. Okay, then we have another subcheck for compare two polytypes. Then the trick is that we just scholarize one and do the uh, subsumption sub checking for the subchecking. Then the annotation uh, sigma two becomes uh, is is supposing that is. Uh, for all to for and the inferred type is for a b and a to b. Then the scholar uh, type variable is is uh, is is a b and row two is a to b. Then then we could see that for a b a to b could instantiate to a b. Then we also need some uh, checking for not accidentally capture free variable. Okay. That uh, uh, so with the subsumption uh, sub checking, we have done the uh, sigma part because we have to do the floating out to make the second sigma into uh, the row, uh, the normal just with normal type variable. Then with another function to handle that case with second as row. That uh, we do apply uh, the same trick, which is we try to see if the first sigma one could uh, instantiate uh, the uh, could be instantiated. Then do the uh, two row checking. Then with both of them are row, then we could. Uh, do the unify. If the second is function, then we have to first make them structurally equivalent. Then do the function uh, checking, and vice versa. If the uh, first one is function, then the second one and uh, do it in reverse. Otherwise, both of them are tall. Then for the function case, then we recursively call itself with the argument of sigma, we have to call the subsumption checking in uh, normal. And for row results, uh, <coughs> for simple row checking. Okay. And that's, uh, that's for further extension. The above all is for the extension of the uh, instantiation to make it uh, compare at the argument annotation to, to make argument annotation at what inferred could be compared at the application case. But now for uh, the walking through the tree, I skipped for the graphing. But with those things, uh, subsumption rule added, uh, we, uh, we just need to add two cases which is uh, make it structurally uh, equivalent, then do the checking, which, which is the floating out things, and checking if the argument uh, and what passing into the, uh, as the lambda 
uh, could be equivalent in the po in the polytype case. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so wrapping up, the Hindley Miller type is the foundation of Haskell 98 standard. Uh, with an introduction of it that uh, you could understand the basic of Haskell uh, or early version of Haskell and higher rank uh, corresponds to Haskell's uh, extension which is rank n types and with this add-on then we could handle the case which the previous example we take care of. and the slides skip a lot of mathematical logical deduc deduction for uh, better comprehension. But if you want to um, look at the anything beyond, then you still have to pick up the jargon. Yeah, and thank you. Yeah, I, I probably got something wrong. No, but, no, no, but it's a very general comment. So, uh, if you okay, so, so this implementation, right? You mm -hmm. need to do references over the place, which makes sense for performance considerations. Yeah. However, you can you can implement the linear type checker. Yeah. Using you know, pure. Yeah, and I I aware of that. Just and, uh, just. Yeah, but, but then getting somewhere with this, okay. which is that uh, if you do it the pure way. You can also find out that it's not necessarily monadic. Mm -hmm. I.e., it can it's enough if you have an applicative which is a source of uh, fresh type variables. Mm -hmm. But if you have that, the rest you can build on top of that, and then you can get an applicative type checker mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. and then it should generalize to the higher uh, higher kind of the higher rank of types. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you're saying that the, the whole monadic approach is a bit of an overkill from a theoretical yeah. point of view. Yeah. Yeah, I, I noticed that they are th discussed about. I mean, this is basically like the like, implementation only presented is basically how it works. But uh, if you just want to understand it, you want to get an understanding of what's going on, if you want to play around with changing it, I think starting from a few more. <laughs> yeah. And the, the other thing is that uh, one property of the human archive system that we didn't mention is that it's non compositional, meaning if you have you know, like two sub expressions and you can't you know, take the type of the first sub expression, take the type of the second, and, and then just from that. Derive uh, anything meaningful about the type of the combination, which means you can get type errors where we have two well type sum expressions. I mean, you as the programmer would say they are well type, but if you like, re replace your program with just that sum expression in the type check, and then the other one also type checks, but you get a type, but if you try to use them together, you get a type error from one of them. And it doesn't make much sense. Uh, if you, you know, if you glance at it, because you know, like, why is this not well typed? I mean, it's perfectly well typed expression. So there's a whole area of uh, compositional type systems, which is you know, something where this property that you can just look at the types of some expression and you can find that into the type of two expression that this property does for. And if you have this property, then you get much better error messages because the error errors will in point that it's the composition of these two, or the combination of these two sub expressions where the error is coming from, and not from any of the two by itself. Yeah. I would love to hear it. Uh, well, I think the master is on this, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you said 
I mean, if you don't refer it to other people, I, I think that uh, the chances that somebody will do a new supplement are a uh, population of people that will do a new supplement is less. Jason Autotype actually was derived from a casual conversation with somebody about union types and intersection types were supposed to be presented. I learned about union types and they were great. Interactive. Okay, let's switch. <laughs> 